Thanks for staying with us. Let's move over to this very important story. Scientists, civil society groups and opposition parties have criticized the COVID-19 draft health regulations. Some say it's a cut and paste of the state of disaster measures. They've questioned the wearing of masks indoors, hand sanitizing and taking of temperatures against the scientific recommendations. The draft health regulations are open for public comments until the 24th of April. That deadline has indeed been extended. Let's get some reaction with Wits University Faculty of Health Sciences and Professor of Vaccinology, Professor Shabi Mahdi and South Africa Center of Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis Professor Alex Walter, thank you both so much for your time. We do appreciate it. Uh, Prof. Alex, maybe I can start with you. There's been much criticism with regards to these new COVID draft regulations. Many are saying that this is still a way for government to try and control South Africans. But if you look at it from a health perspective and trying to control the pandemic, many would say that these uh, regulations that have been drafted are sufficient and are warranted. What is your perspective on this? Well, I, I really don't think that this is a matter for regulation. I mean, we don't have um, an acute crisis with a lot of unknowns like we did two years ago. We don't have measles regulations. We don't have TB regulations. We don't have HIV regulations. And I think we need to talk about advice and support and not about regulations. The whole framework that there was a, a national command council and a provincial command councils, and then there was this ministerial advisory committee, and it was all very secretive, and people that I spoke with at work suddenly became shy and coy and evasive because they were in these secretive meetings. The whole thing is absurd. So, you know, I think we need good advice, and uh, we need access to vaccines, and we need access to the treatments. We need to make them as available as possible, and I think the whole concept of a special regulatory framework is a mistake. And what is your view on this, Professor Mahdi? Because we do know that uh, government says this is a way for them to try and uh, react should there be a spike in infection and the new regulations uh, fall away from the national state of disaster because that's come to an end and it will now fall under the National Health Act. But there's also been criticism around that. Do you think this new way of trying to have some, some sort of regulation in place is the right way? Uh, good afternoon, Heidi. So the key question that we face currently is uh, what did we actually achieve with these regulations? Uh, did these regulations work in preventing infections? And do we need to continue focusing on preventing infections rather than what matters most, which is uh, limiting the number of people that end up in hospital and die of COVID-19? Now, the reality in South Africa is that in our own context, uh, despite all of the regulations that existed, we had more than 80% of the population that were infected at least once with the virus since the start of the pandemic. What that tells us is that many of these regulations did not protect people from being infected with the virus, and there's a number of reasons for that. Uh, what we also now see, have seen with the last wave, with Omicron wave, is a massive decoupling of infections and severe disease. And that is not because we've got a large percentage of the population that have been, inf that have been vaccinated, but rather because of the large percentage of the population that have been infected they now have developed protection against severe disease and death. We can do better by getting more people vaccinated, and particularly people above the age of 50. But for all intents and purposes, however unpalatable it might be for us to accept, uh, these regulations in South Africa did not prevent infections. All that it did is that it lengthened the period of time over which the same number of infections occurred, and in each wave that was probably lengthened by a period of one to two weeks. Now, that might have been important at the start of the pandemic mm -hmm. when very few people had actually had immunity against the virus and, and were not protected against severe disease. But in a context where there's extensive protection against severe disease, uh, the world has moved on. Uh, there's very few countries, except for countries such as China, uh, that are still trying to pretend that we can prevent infections with this virus. So many of the regulations, unfortunately, are completely obsolete and outdated in the science also. When we talk about hand hygiene in the context of COVID, we know that hand hygiene plays very little role in protecting people from being infected with uh, this particular virus. It's got other uh, benefits to it, but certainly not when it comes to protecting people against COVID. Mm. When we talk of face masks, the reality in South Africa is that a type of face mask that 99% of the population wear simply doesn't protect them from being infected and doesn't actually prevent them from expelling the virus into the surrounding uh, into, the, into the surrounding environment. 
uh, if you're wanting to achieve that, you need to use the right type of face mask and you need to wear it correctly. And these are N95 type of face masks, which unfortunately are unavailable. Uh, so do we still need to wear face masks? Yes, certainly at an individual level. People that are above the age of 50 that are wanting added protection, particularly when there's a surge of uh, virus uh, infections taking place. In that context, I would, they would be well advised to be wearing the right type of face mask, especially when indoors in poorly ventilated spaces. But as a public health measure, very little value. Mm. Uh, Professor Alex, maybe we can get your perspective on um, some of the draft regulations. For example, 50% capacity of, um, of uh, indoor or outdoor activities as long as there's proof of vaccination or uh, a negative PCR test not uh, older than 72 hours. Many are criticizing government to say, how is this even possible? Um, yet we know the call has been for people to be vaccinated because it provides the necessary protection against severe uh, illness. What is your your um, perspective on um, this kind of regulation? Well, you know, I did say I think the whole framework is a mistake. And so, um, you know, when politicians are accused of something or other and they say, you know, I will not comment on these scurrilous allegations or not engage. And I, really, I don't really feel like engaging with the specifics of, you know, should you have a 50 percent reduction rule, should you have this or that. I, I think the whole thing you know, people who run these establishments should behave responsibly and figure out what is reasonable. The idea that you can write it down, I think, is not correct. So, um, you know, to parse each bullet point, you know, as I said, I think that the concept of a, a draft of regulations is the wrong approach. So I, I don't really think I want to debate the details. I don't think that I even have formed a serious opinion about specific details. Mm. Have you tried to engage with government? You know, as health experts, we would think that they would consult uh, to have the necessary um, guidance and uh, advice from health experts. I can see Professor Mahdi is smiling. I'm going to get to him in a minute. Uh, but Professor Alex, maybe if you can tell us uh, your engagement with governments. Have you tried to engage with them or are you just waiting to see how this plays out no i mean uh, it's i've not actively tried to engage one-on-one -on -one. you know i think the, the state has lots of access to to appropriate experts and including many colleagues of mine and, and it's not that you know my opinion would not find a way if i really made an effort but i mean I, I've, i'm saying the same things as many other people so there's nothing particularly important about me engaging with government and i haven't um so you know i think it's has government listened appropriately to those experts who are putting forward the updates on what we understand? I think not, um, but it's not about whether I've engaged with government. And you, Professor Mahdi, I know that you have been very vocal since the start of the pandemic on a number of issues. But um, the reason why, and I think it's it's important to clarify this to our viewers as well, is that um, you know South Africans felt very left out and felt as though they were not consulted. This was basically forced upon us, and now suddenly we are asked uh, to comment on these draft regulations. But it's almost as though um, this exercise is going to be. Um, you know, I don't want to use the word useless, but it's like at the end of the day, they make their decisions um, and they decide themselves anyway. How important is it for you, do you think, for government to listen to health experts and to listen to the advice that they are receiving from people who actually deal with these viruses on a daily basis? So, Heidi, the, the absurdity of all of these regulations is that government is actually going against the recommendations of its own advisors. So the Ministerial Advisory Committee recently released a series of advisories, uh, some of which uh, date back to early in January, when many of the regulations that government are trying to hold on to, the Ministerial Advisory Committee of Government itself, in fact, indicated that all of these regulations are obsolete and we should pretty much abandon it. Uh, be it PCR testing of individuals that are coming into the country, be it uh, wearing a face mask, uh, be it hand hygiene, the Ministerial Advisory Committee itself of the National Department of Health have actually put into the public domain advisories, which indicates that most of these regulations which government is trying to hold on to are unwarranted. Uh, so yes, uh, as scientists, we've engaged with government in the public domain, and certainly we will be making a submission in the context of uh, the opportunity to uh, comment on these regulations. Uh, but for all intents and purposes, if government hasn't uh, listened to its own ministerial advisory committee, uh, I think it say, tells a lot about just how much government is actually following the science and I fully agree, there are ulterior motives, either that or government is completely naive in terms of what actually needs to be done moving forward with the COVID pandemic. 
Mm, that is very concerning, the fact that they're not even listening to their advisory committee. Professor Alex, I want to ask you um, with regards to the time frame. I know you say you don't really want to comment on uh, specifics of this draft regulation list that has been provided by the Departments of Health, but uh, many are questioning the time frame and saying that, that now that the deadline has been extended by an additional seven days, it doesn't give much, uh, government much time to actually fully consider public comments that they have received so far. I mean, on um, Friday, or was it Thursday? It was Thursday, when uh, they said there were over 100,000 um, public comments received so far, and they are still counting. Um, do you think it's enough time for government to actually fully consider uh, what South Africans really want? No, I, I think people have been voicing their opinions in, in all sorts of forums uh, for the last two years. I think adding another seven days is completely pointless. It doesn't change anything about um, what people have said and what knowledge is available. It's just uh, responding to the accusation that they haven't given enough time. But I think it's irrelevant to add seven days to this period. Okay, Prof. Alex, maybe we can get more insights uh, from you with what you think would be ideal in terms of any kind of regulations or provisions made should there be a spike in infection of COVID-19. Because governments have made it clear that they don't want the national states of disaster to last forever, but they also don't want to be put in a position where should there be a spike in infection, there is no regulation whatsoever and people um, you know, don't adhere perhaps to mask wearing or social distancing or uh, large gatherings. What would you say would be uh, the ideal draft regulation or regulations that uh, that fall under the National Health Act? Right, that is a fair question and I think it's a difficult question because I'm not really an expert about you know, who has the power to declare what kinds of limitations on activities and when there's economic costs and so I think these are sort of really legal expert questions about what can you do in an emergency, if it's a real emergency, to try to limit uh, transmission a little bit. So just to, to indicate, I mean, um, Shabir Mahdi said, look, we, we don't seem to be very effective at um, limiting infections, and that's true. But if you look at the social breakdown of um, zero prevalence and the prevalence of antibodies, it's very, very different amongst different communities. And so clearly living conditions have a lot to do with how easily it spreads. You know, cramped living conditions lead to lots of spread, and clearly, obviously, cramped working conditions will do the same. So there is some rationale for saying, well, you know, nightclubs and sporting, you know, crowds at sporting events should be limited. But obviously, this whole cycle of destroying livelihoods and so on can't continue. So I think some some way of finding a legal framework that doesn't sort of overtly, in, you know, in, intrude on people's ability to earn a living, um, but that limits certain things that are not hugely impactful, like crowds in indoor spaces. I think a lawyer should, a lawyer should apply their minds to what is feasible. And I think some little bit of power along those lines is not a crazy idea, but I think it shouldn't come with lots and lots of options to limit this, that, and the other in a grab bag, checklist kind of way. Mm, and I think it also has to do with everybody working together and truly understanding um, you know, what regulations could and could not work. Uh, Professor Mahdi, maybe we can end off with you. Uh, you know, many are suspecting that there's going to be a lot of um, backlash and legal action taken against the Department of Health because there's criticism um, that the, a lot of the power has been left in the health minister's hands and uh, many are saying that that's not the right way to go about it. Uh, do you think that the draft regulations um, will succeed and this is the best way to go about it, to try and and find a way to deal with COVID-19, especially if there's a spike in infection. Uh, so, Heidi, before I uh, answer that, I think it's just important for us to understand that it's no longer about preventing infections. Uh, that boat has sailed a long time ago since the virus started to mutate with a type of variance that circulate. Whether you're vaccinated or whether you've been previously infected, it doesn't actually confer much protection against infection, irrespective of what you do, unless you do what China is doing, which is simply beyond the means. Uh, and completely, in, in a sense, probably unethical to be doing in a context of South Africa. So it's not about preventing infections, even when there is a resurgence, as Alex has correctly pointed out, it really comes down to the individual. Those that are at high risk of developing severe disease to take the appropriate measures to protect themselves. Uh, with regard to whether the government will succeed in this uh, initiative, I would be highly surprised uh, if these sort of regulations are actually don't go challenge in a court of law. And I would be even more surprised uh, if the court of law uh, uh, 
argues in favor of government uh, or finds in favor of government. Uh, these speculations are completely incoherent, uh, unnecessary, and simply not fit for, fit for purpose. Okay, great. Thank you so much for your time. We do appreciate it. Um, that was um, Wits University Faculty of Health Sciences and Professor of Vaccinology, Shabir Mahdi, and uh, South African Center for Epidemiological Modeling and Analysis, Professor Alex Walter. Thank you both so much for your time.